Got two great guests, man. We're starting off with Mike DeMarco. I know him as Coach Mike DeMarco, uh, lifting, conditioning coach for Rutgers Gymnastics, Rutgers Wrestling. Um, started a couple gyms, moved, moved his gym a couple times, expanding. Great story. Can't wait to hear from him. And then we'll follow that up from uh, one of our Rutgers goats, Rutgers legends, Marco Battaglia, uh, All-American football player for Rutgers. Um, from 1992 to 1995, played in the NFL for many years, Super Bowl champion. Excited to hear from him too, man. He has a great presence at Rutgers. The football facility that just got built is named after him. So, man, goody, I'm excited to hear from them too. How you been doing this last week? What's new in, uh, in the head co life of the head coach, Scott Goodale? Uh, nothing's really new, man. It's kind of the same old stuff. I got awesome news yesterday. Golf courses are going to open up. So yeah. it was like an arms race to see who was going to get the first tee times over at Pine Barrens. So luckily I'm in this group. We play 24 guys, uh, big match, big money match. So I got, got that to look forward to tomorrow. It's going to be a great weekend. So I'll play a bunch of golf this weekend and that's really it. Everything same old, same old doing some, uh, still having these meetings, obviously meeting with coach DeMarco, who we're going to hear from. I'm so pumped up for today, man. This is a, it's so hard to follow these up, right? Everybody was so fired up for geo. Yeah. They're fired up for Frazier, so we keep – they're fired up for Edgar. We keep doing – getting these guests, and it keeps getting bigger and better, and everybody wants it. And I kind of think it's going to come to an end, and they're like, no, you need to do this. You need, We love hearing from Anthony. We love hearing from these these guys. So we'll just keep doing it as long as it's making people happy, you know? Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, I didn't know – I didn't know what we were going to end up doing with this, and it's been fun, man. I, I have visions of maybe like when you're – going through your season next year, man, this is a way to give updates to the people and uh, whether it's roster updates, coaches updates, whatever it may be, NJRTC up updates, SKWC, you know, this is a good platform to do that. And hopefully it takes a little bit off your shoulders too, of people coming at your neck, asking you questions. Yeah, no, no doubt. And it's a good time to kind of sit and think about it and some of the questions and you're right. This is probably a pretty good idea it's, instead of a media day or whatever the case might be, but by the way, that poster in the background, is that a poster? That's an awesome setup you got going back you know, there. You know, I'm all Anthony Ashnell today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a walking billboard, man. I love it. I love I, it. I can't, yeah, I can't say enough about uh, people that support me. You know, Scrap Life done a great yeah. job. They gave me this, uh, this mic and headphones and this whole setup and the poster behind me, man. Very grateful for them and grateful for you guys as well. Everyone that supports me, man, uh, just try to keep it authentic and it comes full circle. A good part of, part of building a program or, or sustaining a program is having great people around. So that's yeah. the reason for it all. And you deserve all of it. Just a reminder to the fans out there. You can come chat with Anthony and I face to face by downloading the fan cred app, watching the show in the on air section then pressing the green fan line button at the bottom. This is going to be different, right? Cause we have a couple guests coming on. Um, so there might not be this. This is probably a really good day for questions. I don't know how many people will be able to get on live with us, but uh, there's already a question. What's my handicap? At the end of the year, I was an eight. I'm not playing at an eight right now. When I told them last night what I was, I told them a 10, and they tried to put me at an eight. No way. I'm getting two aside tomorrow, <laughs> and uh, I haven't played at all, so uh, I'm getting two aside. So what's it gonna what's gonna look like are they making you guys schedule beforehand to go on the course or like do you kind of just walk on with your own stuff and no not... we had to get a tea time uh, we're from like nine to a from nine to i think 10 20 we have tea times and we're allowed to go foursomes which that isn't happening everywhere um so that's good i'm sure i'm sure the flag sticks are going to remain in there'll be no rakes in the bunkers there'll no there'll be no ball washers uh I don't know if the cups are going to be raised, which last time they I played there, the cups were raised. So that made yeah. it just attack the cup, and my putting got a lot better because of it. So back of the cup. You know, we'll, we'll see. But, you know, there'll be a lot of – I mean, social distancing. I don't get the whole twosome putting them out every 16 minutes. That doesn't – if you're playing golf, there's plenty of social distancing with the group in front of you. So I don't get there every 16 minutes. But I'm not the governor, so, um, yeah. you know. Are yeah. they have are they having everyone have like their own carts or walking or yeah, I think you're allowed one person a cart unless you're a family member and there there goes my part. Eddie Carney invites his son, who's probably the best golfer of the group, puts him on his own team. So he rigs the whole system to from the get-go. <laughs> it's like I already feel like I'm donating 50 bucks to charity. This guy gets <laughs> in front of a four handicap. Nobody knows the kid. 
right? So he's playing. He's, he's a dark he's a horse. Four, yeah, he's <laughs> a dark, but he's a four handicap. So and and they get to ride in the cart together. Yeah, where I have to walk. So no big deal. Uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> little deal adversity, adversity, man. Little adversity. Yeah, little adversity never hurt. We'll I got a, I got a question from Mike in the comments. How about Pat Downey as a guest? Guy is a laugh riot. Uh, yeah, I agree. Maybe maybe we get him on in the future. Uh, right now, we just had so many great guests back to back. It's like trying to one up the one before. And yeah. even though we're called hashtag the wrestling room, man, we just have some awesome guests. And hashtag the wrestling room goes a lot farther. We're just having um having these guys share their stories. There's so much so much philosophies and thoughts that are intertwined and similar uh, similar beliefs, similar upbringings um just the stories that we've been hearing man have have been inspiring to get another guy that's better another guy that's within the Rutgers community that we could reach out to and see if he'll come on so yeah maybe we get pat downey on here but it's been great so far he would be good man i i think the best thing about this show for me because i'm always trying to learn and i know you are as well is we've gotten so many different genres or so many different sports right we got a ufc fighter got a baseball player and you got a basketball player, and then you got you and I are involved in the wrestling world. Just the mindsets are similar, uh, and just picking their brains on what they're thinking and all how to face how to face adversity and and deal with it and overcome it. And and every guy we've had on has failed at a high level. You know they they fail whether it's missing a big shot or losing a title fight or striking out in the ninth inning. It's it's crazy. Uh, and like you said, everybody keeps wanting up each other and. It's an arms race. Who are we going to have on next, right? And people will start texting me right after this. You got to have this guy. You got to have that guy. And it doesn't have to be wrestling. Yeah, that's our hashtag, the wrestling room. I think that's because it's you and I. But it could be anything, any walks of life where we're open for anything. And and uh, today's interesting, man. You talk about overcoming adversity. Mike DeMarco, I'll tell the story now before he gets on because I really want to listen to him. But he, he was the first guy I really met when I stepped foot on campus um, in 2007, eight season, he was the first guy I met. He wasn't, he was kind of a walk on. He placed in the state at 106 back then. I think he was seventh in the state. So I didn't recruit 103, that 103 then. 103 then. So anyway, as the story goes, I tried to recruit over Mike every single year. Every single year I tried to get rid of him. He was too small. Mm -hmm. He wasn't good enough, blah, blah, blah. I always tried to recruit over him. I'm not ashamed to say that. We we're trying to get better guys. And he was always the starter. He, he started for four years. Even when his high school teammate, I think Matt Fusco, kind of took over his spot for a, for a portion of it. He, he started most of the year, really, for four straight years. So it's an incredible story. He now has an incredible career. He's super, super uh, successful in his business world. And then to hire him was a no-brainer. And just the relationship, obviously, he has with you. Uh, and obviously he has with all of our guys, it's crazy uh, just having an extra coach. Really, that's what he is. And he's our strength coach. But because he's lived it, lived wrestling, lived dieting, lived cutting weight, lived sleep habits, lived all that stuff, he can relate to our guys. He's just another voice. And uh, it's just an incredible story, man. It's an incredible story. Yeah, man. And it's a story for those kids that maybe in like seventh, eighth grade going to high school undersized or – high school going to college undersized man like it doesn't matter he wrestled 103 as a senior and you go on he's if you see him now he's jacked up looking strong uh lean um doesn't matter man you it'll ha it could happen for you as long as you're willing to put in the work though because he's the he's the kind of guy that never never missed the day i feel like he always he always brought a shovel um to work to practice meaning like he always he always went went to work hard and whether it was lifting wrestling, whether he was getting beat up in the room or whether he was doing the beating up, he always worked, man. And he does, he brings the same energy and that same passion to coaching, whether he's lifting with us or just putting us through workouts or conditioning workouts. It's like he comes to work every day, same energy, same mic, never, never a down moment with him. And, and the coolest part is where we're, we got like four or five, probably blue chippers, right. Coming in this year. And then we probably got four or five guys that are Mike DeMarco type guys. So I'm excited to get my hands on those new fresh faces and recruits. I'm sure Mike is, but those type of guys are the ones that remind me of DeMarco. Right. He's backstage now. Right. Let's get him on and uh, and see what, what he's doing. And, and this is going to be good because it's going to answer a lot of questions I get every day. How are you handling your athletes? What are your athletes doing? Well, Mike and Mike's really the, uh, the go-to guy when Mike. it comes to that. My so guy. Mike, What's going, What's going on? on? I've been going? waiting all week for this moment. Yeah. <laughs> Ready to tease it. 
Yeah. yeah. It's a big yeah. spot for you, man. It's a big spot. Nah, it's only as big as you make it. Yeah. 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 So I get the question every day, how are you handling your athletes? Let's start. Let's start with that. Like, and I always say, you know, they're in constant communication with Mike DeMarco, our strength and conditioning coach. Give us a, it'd be impossible to give us a, a total rundown of what you do, but give us a short rundown of, of kind of how you're dealing with our guys individually, how you're dealing with our coaching staff, because we're also training and, and we're going to get to Anthony, but um, let, let's start with, with what you're doing with our guys. Uh, for, you know, just to get started here, just to share a little bit of the thought process that goes into the details of it. COVID-19 has forced us to uh, lock down on the essentials, you know, and, and essential people are, are the only ones allowed to go to work. And the essential things in our lives are the things that we're still doing every day. So um, it's really brought to light how essential relationships are with each of our guys. Um, and we have spent so many hours in the last six weeks building those relationships uh, more so than ever. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately that's really been priority for me. And I know it's been priority for, for coach Goodell and, and the rest of our staff is, is just trying to connect with them as frequently as possible to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, it's, it goes above and beyond delivering workouts and making sure they're doing X, Y, and Z uh, type of exercises. Um, you know, it's, it's really been about the relationship game and, and just checking in with them and making sure that, you know, they, they know that we're there for them. And if they need more from us, we're ready to give it to them. So, um, you know, relationships have been huge. Uh, on top of that, just to dig a little bit deeper, each guy, the first two days we went into quarantine, uh, we kind of, we, we sent out a questionnaire assessment and figured out exactly what each guy on the team had. Some guys had nothing. Some guys had nicer or if not the same uh, tier gym as we have up at school. So uh, we were then able to provide each guy on the team with a program relative to their resources, uh, their training goals, and, the, and their situations. So that's the, the, those have been really the two highlights so far. Yeah. Um, at, at your gym, man, you're able to give some of your equipment out and have some of your uh, clients take it home and get some workouts, like you're saying. But at Rutgers, did they allow any of that kind of thing? Did they allow, like, did they allow the athletes to come in that weight room and take a 50 pound kettlebell if they needed it or something like that? It, it was a case by case basis. If, you know, from guys on our staff, if we felt it was a real necessity where someone needed something, we made sure we, we were able to make that happen for them. There were certain guys on our team that were able to take a few pieces of equipment home. Again, just essential things that we felt they needed to get them through this time. We weren't sending home barbells and, and power racks for each guy on the team, but they certainly got enough to make sure that they were able to do something every day and provide resistance and load for that too. So it's not just body weight movement. Right. Let me ask you this, Mike, I, uh, especially in this time, really maybe any time, but how important is loyalty to the program you're doing? So, uh, you know, we have a lot of fans, 60 year olds, 50 year olds, whatever the case might be. And it's like a diet, right? If it's not working after a week, they're on to the next fat or whatever the case might be. So, and that includes my family. So I want to know how important it is to stick to the routine, stick to the loyalty to the program. Like how mm -hmm. loyal do you have to be that program? Or can I get off a program? Is it just, just pick up weight, put weight down or how, or should I be sticking to a certain program? That's a good question. Um, it's something that uh, I kind of answer ever so often now. And in quarantine, as it relates specifically to sport, we don't know when we're coming back for sport. So it's not fair to, it's not fair for me as a strength coach designing workouts to say we're competing uh, November 3rd. We like to hope that we are, but at the end of the day, we don't know we are. So in my mind, we can't backtrack all the way to now and say, oh, well, we should be doing uh, X, Y, and Z right now because that's where we are relative to the normal calendar. It's not a normal calendar. Uh, so, so, you know, relative to sport, it's, it's hard to, to answer that question because, uh, and, and it goes back to the guys having different resources also. You know, it's not, it's not fair to assume every guy on the team can stay loyal to the same program because all, all 35 guys are different right now. Um, I, I ultimately, whether you're an athlete or general population or my mother-in-law just trying to live healthier, it's about consistency. And you need to find something that works for you. You know, I, uh, a few months back, uh, I was 
I was talking with Lisa, Coach Goodell's wife, a little bit, and we were trying to find something that worked for her. And now she's found something that works for her. And it doesn't even come for me. I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not one to, to sit here and, and have an ego and get upset when, when guys don't want to do it exactly how I say. I want to help deliver something to you that's going to make it work for you. Like if, if there's something out there that is more consistent for you, let's do it. And I'm going to help you um, do it better. So, you know, for, for our guys, it, it comes down to trust. And the relationship, and if they trust us, they trust our relationship. They're going to stay consistent to what we have to offer. And um, you know, I, I, there's really no one program right now that's that's the best. Or you know, it's really just move every day. Make sure you're doing something different, moving different planes, and and just have variety. Yeah, I right feel now. like that's an important mindset for your profession right now, man. Like, like to just be not not that you don't have great knowledge, but just to be still an open book, a sponge. You're taking in information like you're you're not like saying my my program's the best program in the world you got to do my program it's the only way like you're willing to learn you're willing to get in front of different uh strength coaches and um this past big tens it stood out to me a lot you were excited about it too man you got you got all the big 10 coaches together all the different strength coaches and you had a little seminar meetings of the minds where you guys got to pick each other's brains and learn from each other what what Iowa wrestling's doing what Nebraska wrestling's doing what's Rutgers wrestling doing and um come to better conclusions. Every, everyone comes be to better conclusions. And uh, I think that goes a long way in every profession, but I, I always admire that from you, you know, and even when I come in to work out, man, like it's, it's, you're attacking my weaknesses, which I love. Like you're, uh, you're just scientific about it. You know, you're, you, you're like, well, you, you're, you're telling me this, this part of your body's weak. Like, let's get to work on that part of the body. And like, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I love that. Like, I want to be a hundred, I, I want to be an animal <laughs> in every aspect. So um, it's not just like, when you go to wrestling practice, I'm really good at a single leg. It's not like, all right, let's drill a single again. It's like, all right, well, how about your high crotch? How's that? Not that good. Let's work on that. Um, and I love that about yeah. you. A little bit what I wanted to hear from you is that transition of going from high school to college, man, being undersized. And I wanted to know, is that where you first found your passion in trying to become a strength and conditioning coach, being an undersized college uh, wrestling athlete? Or was it something else, uh, a different scenario in your life that, that drove you to that? Uh, I, I think about this a lot and uh, going back to high school and even, even before high school, I always had a knack for, for working out and, and exercising. And through my high school years, I, I didn't touch a weight. If I touched a weight, it was because coach Weave had us uh, in the dungeon lifting weights before practice one day. But it, for me, I was under the assumption that wrestlers run and boxers run and, and, you know, you get, better off the map by just running. So I would log seven to 10 miles a week. I had the same route. I had a chart in my garage and I would run the same route every day. And for 30 days, I, I had to beat it by a second. And then I would make a new route. And every day, if I beat it by a second, I knew I was getting better. And in my mind, that, would, that was equating to better results on the mat. Uh, in retrospect, as I transitioned into college looking back and I started to get into my degree in exercise science and learning, that was not the right approach at that time or, or even for our sport necessarily you know my the type of physical capabilities i was born with uh naturally lent themselves to having a gas tank already so i was just pouring more gasoline on the fire and i wasn't doing what you just mentioned prior to this question and that's i wasn't exposing my weaknesses i wasn't working on strength i wasn't working on light strength you know so um it, i i guess to answer your question it came it came from a number of different things happening at the same time at Rutgers. You know, one was my degree program in exercise science. One was the fact that I was 118 pounds and, and uh, you know, I had to wrestle 125 and I was wrestling grown men that were cutting down from 142, you know. So all of the timing of that happened uh, together and just kind of made me come to the realization of how beneficial it would be if I can take my experience and knowledge and, and things I was learning at Rutgers as a student of exercise and as an athlete at the same time to bring them back to Mike DeMarco that was in high school. There's so many of me that are in high school right now that could benefit from that kind of fire that occurred at the same time. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, it, was a, it was a number of different things. Uh, that that happened at Rutgers over the yeah, course man, of five years. If I was years. that high school athlete listening right now, man, I'd be fired up. I'd want to. I'd want to sign up for motives tonight. 
<laughs> so, so I got I got a couple big ones for you. Before you came on, and before we get into that, we have a question for you. Who's the best conditioned athlete on the team? I know the strongest. You're going to go with Gerard Angelo, pound for pound. Who's the best conditioned athlete on our team? Joe Grella. That's a good answer. I didn't. I, yeah, I kind of. Yeah, I guess thinking about it, you'd probably go there. That makes sense. And he spends a lot of time with. You. Yeah, so, he he ran a, he ran a five twenty two mile this yeah, preseason. That's pretty good. And we don't even we don't yeah. even run. So again, be, before you got on, I gave the story how, and you tell it all the time how we we I always tried to recruit over you. I always tried. I don't know if you're listening, but always tried to find the next best recruit to replace Mike DeMarco. And you you wrestled for four years. Just why? Why why keep coming back? Why keep going through uh, Division One wrestling at the highest level? Why the grind? You knew what we were trying to do. You kind of knew where we wanted to go in the future. You're obviously a part of that now. But back then you weren't. You know, you were just an athlete and maybe you didn't know where, where it was going to lead to. So why keep coming back? Why keep facing the adversity? Why keep fighting? Uh, just where does that come from, that mindset? It, I, I really latch on to this theme that's followed me through my whole life from high school to college to even my professional life now. And when I was in high school, I went to public school for two years at Lindhurst High School, and I didn't make it out of district tournament. Uh, my freshman and sophomore year, I was 70 and 80 pounds. My dad presented me the opportunity to go to a Catholic school and just put myself in an environment that would at least give me the resources to potentially wrestle in college. So I made the decision uh, as a sophomore, like, yeah, I really want to wrestle in college. So we made the move. Uh, that, those next two years, I, I went from not making it out of districts to winning two titles and two region titles and you know, going into the state tournament. My senior year, uh, seated third and, and losing to a Tiger in the quarters <laughs> that I will not name. But uh, anyways, like that, that theme started in high school at that time. And, Who was it, Pat um, Hyman? I wasn't. Re- Nick, no, Nick Hyman. <laughs> yeah. A crackdown high C with about 15 <laughs> left. <But> anyways, <laughs> I, uh, uh, after, you know, in high school, I wasn't, I wasn't recruited by a single Division One university. Uh, it was all Division Three. You know, I was getting money to go to Division Three, and I went down to Virginia Beach my senior year and took fourth at Senior Nationals. And I was walking around the coaches' uh, recruiting thing that they have in one of the conference rooms. And the Rutgers coaches at the time they weren't Coach Goodell, but they they just saw me take fourth and they were questioning me and whatnot. But anyways, I wound up going going up to Rutgers on a visit the next week. I got accepted, and then. You know, here I was, I had a choice to make. I could go division three and, and you know, wrestle to my my current abilities, or I could go D1 and, and, and really chase down something that I wasn't supposed to do. And that was the first time I really made a decision like that, aside from transferring, you know. So fast forward to Rutgers and just stepping on campus, I had already made that why in my brain, regardless of who you were going to recruit over me. I already knew going into Rutgers, I went there with that intent. I went there to you could call it proving people wrong. You could call it whatever, but I went there knowing I wasn't supposed to be the guy, but I wanted to be the guy. And that's why I went there. I didn't go there. I didn't go there to be an academic guy or a roster guy. I I wanted to go there and, and and be someone that everyone said I couldn't be. Um, So I think that was really like the driving fire in me the entire time that I was at school. And there were so many things that happened over the course of those five years as I matured, mentally as well, where I just started to latch onto things and, and common phrases we use with our guys still is, you know, control the controllables. And looking back, that's what I was doing without even knowing I was doing it at that time. And um, over the course of five years, whether, you know, I was warming up in the back next to Fusco and, and I would wait for Goody to give the, <laughs> give the one, two and, and not pick me or not, you know, it's in that moment as, as an immature wrestler you can get very frustrated and upset and let it affect you when you go to practice the next day but if you reframe and refocus what just went down in that moment and realize okay i can't control coach goodell's thoughts in that moment but what i can control is my effort tomorrow and tuesday and wednesday and thursday so that when we get back to next friday and we're wrestling american i made sure that the 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 next five days are going to affect his decision next week to the best of my ability um, and that's really how I took it. it was one one day at a time. Yeah, that's man. really cool to hear. Like, I, I hope some of our guys on the team are hearing that because 
I feel like sometimes they're in that position and it's like they think they're the only guy in the world that's ever been in that position and they don't get picked to go out and wrestle at the rack and they're all upset and it, it carries over to that whole week of practice, man. And um, just to have that mindset goes a long way and coaches notice that, man. The moment that they pick the guy and that guy doesn't perform on, on the mat in the spotlight, they're going to look at the kid's body language that they didn't pick that practice and see how he's doing. And if he's still down, they're like, all right, well, we'll just ride with this guy and see how it goes. And um, I think too many situations, guys don't take advantage. Like, even though they're not the guy right now, they let their short-term emotion just get to them and and it causes it causes worst results in, in terms maybe of not being the starter or not getting another chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. And it's now to be in the position I'm in and to be in the back tunnel of the rack where I was that athlete, wow, almost 10 years ago. And to be standing next to our guys that are dealing with that, I don't think they understand at times that I know what's going on in their head. And I just, while I'm back there, I try to go back in time and think, what was I thinking? And just be a voice of reason in that moment and talk to both guys and not lean one way or the other and be like, Make sure you're ready and make sure you're ready because no matter who's going out, you're, you're representing each other and, and this program and, and you're going to go out and do that. And when the other guy gets sent out, I stay back and I talk to the other guy. I'm like, listen, you know, next week's your shot. You know, you can't, you yeah, can't harp on why, that. That's so, why we're so lucky. It's, that's it's why really we're so cool lucky now. to have someone like you, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is uh, we got a couple more minutes here. I want, I want to touch on a couple things, your videos with Anthony and all the, workouts you're sending him and you and your wife are doing and obviously anthony's putting out on on social media that really my whole friend group and my whole family group and everyone in our town are doing now because of what we're seeing where does that relationship come come from with you two where did this idea come up with i know a lot of it probably has to do with quarantine but you were doing this you two are doing this maybe it's his lead up to the trials you guys have been doing this for a while now uh just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for me, I got a quick story to introduce it, man. Like, I remember I was in high school wrestling at the region tournament. Billy was wrestling in college with Mike, and Billy and Mike were getting ready for probably the EIWAs at the time. So they came to Union High School, little one-mat room to get a workout in. And uh, I remember going back there, wrestling a little bit with them. <clears throat> and I didn't really know Mike super well at the time. I knew he was good friends with Billy, but, like, no, nowhere near the relationship we have uh, currently. and. I just remember like I was starting to not close the gap or score on Billy, but I was kind of starting to figure out his game a little bit. And uh, Mikey, Mikey and Billy were totally different wrestlers. Mike's like sh super strong, you know, like strong hand fight, strong claw on top. And he was a weight class before Billy, but I still remember like just feeling him. And I was like, dang, like who the heck is this guy? <laughs> like, I know I watched, I watched him wrestle, but like, <laughs> I remember like just after that day, I was like, dang, like, who, like this kid a state champ in high school like who is this kid and like i just could i couldn't figure it out because i maybe he was just a lot stronger a lot better at the time but from the from that moment i just remember just being around him and just his personality his charisma i was like i need to get i need to get around this kid more or just like that was the initial reaction i had the first first icebreaker and then um fast forward 10 years now um i think we just built a great relationship from them and that was kind of the, the starting point yeah, it's crazy. I I honestly forgot about that story until you until you just brought it up because uh, I remember that little yeah. room in the backside. Billy yeah. and I were getting after it. Um, yeah, I think. Well, I know that you know over the years, I Anthony and I have have always kept in touch whether I was at Rutgers or not. And uh, Billy's one of my really good friends, and and that's you know from from just a relationship. It comes back to having a relationship, you know, and um during but fast forward to now to quarantine uh anthony and i a few months back just during our workouts have been have been talking and, and realizing you know how much of an impact he has with the youth and how much of a following he has with the youth and and really trying to just brainstorm and figure out a way where you know he can leverage himself to to help them even more you know, and, and figure it, we were just kind of toying with the idea of trying to figure out how to, how to give them resources to help them become better wrestlers. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where our, I guess the train of thought kind of started. And now that we're in quarantine, uh, there were a few, I remember the first few days of quarantine, it was, it was a struggle. It was a, it was very hard to not find that competitive fire to train. And, and I would text back and forth for workouts and, 
I remember the first time I texted him because I, I, I subconsciously wanted him to fire back and do it and tell me what he got. And it was, it was just a desire to compete. So I shot him a workout. I said, Hey, I did this. Here's my time. Here's what I got. Tell me what you get. And then he did it almost immediately and sent me back a video. Uh, and I, and from that moment forward, it was just kind of organic. Then, you know, now every week me and him have already done two this week and it's really turned into me being, uh, a presence right now as a coach for him to still create some type of competitiveness for him. I really see that from my end. Um, and for him, I guess it's the same way, you know, just finding that competitive fire. We we're trying to find ways to compete right now and it can't be on the mat. So, you know, those workouts that we're posting are the challenges. We're not, we're not just like sitting back creating them and like, wow, this one's going to be a good one. We're just, we're making them to go against each other and then we're filming it and then putting it out there to let people know, Hey, here's what we did this week. So it's really just, well, it's been, it's been awesome, man. It's been awesome to do them. It's been awesome to be a part of them. It's, but we learn from you every day. I learn from you every day. I think we need to have you back on. I think we need to have you back on this show because I think there's so much more I want to get to. And, uh, I knew this would happen. Though I knew this could be a whole hour with just you and all the science you know behind it. And, you know, and I don't know if you know this, but with everything going on, we're doing these virtual tours of the facility, the new facility. And Mike comes on the calls. And if you're an underclassman, you have to generate the call. So these guys are calling us with six coaches on the on a Zoom. And Mike brings them through our weight room and discusses every little nick and cranny of the weight room. It's a whole heck of a lot different going you know, <laughs> looking at college Avs weight room compared to what we have now, that's for sure. But all the work you've done to learn the science of it and everything we're doing, I feel so darn comfortable knowing that you're going to get these guys to to the point where they can achieve their goals, whether it's Anthony's an Olympic dream or, or whether it's an incoming freshman trying to make our lineup. So uh, we're certainly grateful, man. Um, before I leave, though, I know you and I talk obviously every day and you're pretty excited about my uh, – my who you bring into the island question and you've had a lot of thought about it so you, you're stuck on the island for a couple months now and uh you know who who uh who you're bringing and you and here's the deal because i'm going to ask marco this you can't bring your wife she's all right you can she's part of it uh, she's dude. part of it how about that she's part of it. three other all right, she's she, a given. She's a given, all right? She's a, I, I mean she my i I'm not going to, I'm going to brag about my wife. Honestly. I'm not going to, I'm not gonna even going to hide it because she's a jack of all trades. She, she cooks. She's the best cook I have. Sorry to my mom. Uh, she's my workout partner. She's someone that just inspires me to do everything, you know? So um, I think covering those bases, which are huge rocks in my life, I got to bring entertainers. I'm bringing Sinatra. I'm bringing, I'm bringing Sinatra because we need a little low key yeah. entertainment. I'm bring, bringing Bruce, Bruce to, to fire it up. Uh, and, and I don't know, I've been toying with this one, but I think I'm going to bring Kevin Hart wow. just to keep the mood light three, and wow. fun. Three different shows on I, rotation every night. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, three different, three different moods. You want to have fun all the time. You hang out with Kevin. You want to go low key. You bring out Frankie. Cool, man. Well, listen, dude, we appreciate you coming on. You're the man. I'm sure I'll probably be talking to you in an hour. Uh, but uh, we appreciate everything you do. I know Anthony appreciates it. You're, oh, you're yeah. the best. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. No, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate you guys. You, Thank man. you. The man behind all, all my workouts, all, for sure. You look on my Instagram, that's that's Mike, man. That Those workouts are all Mike. So I appreciate <laughs> you, man. Uh, I definitely love you from the bottom of my heart. Hopefully we're uh, working together for a lot longer. We will. I love See you guys. Thank you. Buddy. Yeah, that's uh, we got a we got a question, Mike. Real quick before we get Marco, he's going to come on here. Uh, do you have a time frame when the athletes will be allowed? I, we don't have a time frame right now. We're just we're going along with it. Once they're able to open up the facility, we will be in there. I could guarantee you that. But right now, I don't, I don't have a time frame on that. Yeah, we he's got a, good, right, man? Yeah, we got another question too. What does he work with uh, nutrition with the athletes? And we have. Uh, actually like certified two nutritionists that work with all Olympic sport athletes that that's their only job. But of course with Mike's expertise in that field. Yeah. Like I think the guys naturally go to him first. And uh, I know I have, I need, I mean, whether it's what I'm putting in my body, what kind of protein I'm taking, whatever it may be. Um, he's super, super knowledgeable in that, in that field. So I think all of our guys initially go to him with that stuff. When our administration allowed us to hire a full-time strength and conditioning coach, we knew right away who would be. It was an absolute game changer. 
when you were there, we had Evan Esch, who was awesome. Yeah, yes. uh, but he just was in between his gym and us and the gym. And Mike is there 24 seven. He's in the facility. And then when he leaves, he goes to, you know, his gym motives, but he's with us whenever we need us. He's on the road. It's just such a game changer again, because he's been through the program. Like you said, the nutrition side of it and the science behind lifting and I know you feel, you know, super comfortable with him for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's important that uh, guys feel comfortable and can go to their strength coach with those questions. Cause I remember, I mean, um, just thinking back to some of my recruiting trips, some of the strength coaches seem like just, uh, just another guy that gets thrown Hard at timers. The, yeah. Yeah. Like it's thrown at the wrestling team. And it's so, Hard timers. Yep. it's such an advantage. And in a lot of the big 10, you see it now, most of the guys are wrestling related or they just know their stuff. So. Um, Here's the deal too. And, and when you're hurt, you're with DeMarco during the practice. You just don't it's not, it's not a break anymore. Yeah. It's not <laughs> a break anymore. So. You almost, you'd rather it, just wrestle. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> this is going to be good, man. We got Marco, you know, probably next to you. This is probably Rucker's favorite son right here. So we're yeah. going to bring him in. I'm fired up to see him. It's been a while since I've actually seen him uh, and spoke to him. Uh, but this, this dude's, this is a, this is a class act. He's such a big personality. Marco. What's up, boys? Yo, what, How you doing? Are you getting an echo? Yeah, a little bit of an echo. What do I need to do? Maybe turn down your volume just a little bit. <laughs> it's amazing. We bring you on. We haven't had a, an issue ever. We bring you on immediately. There's an I'm issue. always screwing something up. Is that better? <laughs> yeah. That's much better, man. What's up, guys? Doing? Thanks for having me. But let me jump in real quick. I mean, how about Mike DeMarco? Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> I mean, as I'm listening, I think I could speak on behalf of all the fans watching. I literally was doing push-up sit-ups while I was listening to you guys because that guy's energy is off the charts. Yeah, it is. It is. He's a stud. <laughs> he's good, man. He's good at what he does. And I love it, too, because you look at him, right? He's short. He's small. When he takes his shirt off, he's jacked and ripped, and it's so much more to it than just picking up weight and putting it down. He's got such a science behind it. And he could train anybody. Yeah. Anybody. Ten years old. To 65, man, it's great. His yeah. en his energy is is unbelievable, it really is. Yeah. Well, so what's doing, been, guys? What's give, doing? Give, give us life in quarantine. Where you're at? What you're where you're at? Your family? What's going on? So I'm uh I'm actually in Queens, where I live. Uh, ironically, my emergency hospital is Elmhurst, right up the road, which is uh epicenter of this whole New York City quarantine and COVID. So it's been interesting. It's been interesting. It's uh, where are we going on day forty-five? Feels yeah, like it feels so like day three hundred. Yeah, it does. It does because obviously everybody on this panel is uh, super type A, and we need to be moving. If you're not moving, you're dying. Yeah. You know, it's funny because a lot of the people that I, uh, you know, friends of mine and and coworkers, they always know me as moving around all the time. My family knows how I am too, but I got a I got a new nickname in the quarantine the great white shark never stops moving just slowly slowly stalking oh just stalking <laughs> stalking prey I, like i told my wife i've become a licensed electrician a licensed plumber oh we lost them we got to get them back on Uh, uh, I don't know what happened. And this is, yeah. this is a great, are you there? I got yeah, you. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. Should we tell him to turn down his volume a little? I don't know. Can you hear that echo a little bit? Yeah, I heard it a little bit. It got better. Yeah, it did. I'm sure they'll bring him back on. Yeah. See, you could tell he's already getting into story mode, man. I yeah, love it. I yeah. love it. Oh, he's got dude. a cool little uh, hangout room. I want to see that. Got a setup there, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. He has oh. a setup. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's down in his basement. But, uh, yeah, I was I was uh, curious. Actually, I wanted to know going from Mike to him. Like, I wonder what Rutgers' what strength and conditioning facility looked like in 1992, 1995. Because I we were listening to that uh that one. Here we go. He's back on behind yeah. backstage here. Let's see. It. Let's see if they bring him on on bring him on here. Yeah, I don't even know where they lifted. Right, there was no right. health center. Apologize, I guys. No hey, how's that? Is that better? Much better. That's better. Much All right, better. good. About Once that. Once you turn that mic down, yeah, that, that was good. All right. I put yeah. the headset. So go ahead. You're, you're, you're plumbing, you're electrician. Oh, I got it. Scotty, I got it all going on. There is no project that was left undone. It's all good. So let's get back to work. Crazy, man? 
my son and I run out off the top of his head. He's like, Dad, I want to paint the room. And every time we paint a room, right, we bring in a, a professional. We ran out. I start putting tape up, <laughs> knocking everything yeah. off. Boom, we're painting rooms now. We're doing everything. I'm cooking. Marco, I'm cooking now. Listen, whatever it takes in quarantine, right? <laughs> yeah. You, any, uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Ant. Ask that, ask that question. So uh, coming from Mike, just my uh, my curious thoughts are wandering, you know. Uh, I'm wondering what's it like in 1992 – to 1995 at Rutgers strength and conditioning facility. Are you guys, do you guys have a weight room? Do you have a program? Is it kind of left to be on your own? Cause I was listening to one of your uh, interviews talking about being in Cincinnati um, uh, in the NFL. And you were talking about how they didn't even have a off season facility to train in. So I'm wondering what's the college scene like in the, in the early nineties. Well, we had, we had great strength coaches, uh, Rock Gullickson, Skip Fuller. I mean, these guys were really ahead of their time. Rock spent probably 20 years in the NFL. Um, so, I mean, we, we did what we, we, we did the best we could with what we had. Uh, if you guys have been in the Hale Center, the Hale Center weight room today yeah. does not look anything look like yesteryear. Yeah. Um, I think if you walk in the door, there's two pillars and that was it. So you had, you know, waves of guys, 30, got 30 guys in 30 guys out, 30 guys in, you know, squat days were always an issue, but, uh, you got it done. You made the best of yeah. what you, what you can do. And if you were committed, you were going to get results. And, uh, the majority of the guys were committed. It wasn't as intense. It wasn't as scientific as it is today, but, um, listen, like Mike said, and the energy behind Mike and his competitive nature and his uh, outdoing out the next guy, that, that's how you're successful. Um, you know, I went, I walked into the weight room and I just wanted to work out until the last guy left and I was still in there because I wasn't going to let anyone outwork me. Um, so, you know, listen, it, it's the same. It's just the product. You're a product of your environment. And at, at the time, the environment was... Not not as scientific it is, is now, but uh, you know you made the best of it. Yeah, back then it was truly pick up the weight, put pick it, it down, and put pick it up, and walk. <laughs> yep. Farmers <laughs> walk down the hallway. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, man. I sometimes worry that our place is too nice. You know, I always worry yeah. about it. it's going to be too nice. It's going to. I always worried about that, and that's the one thing I loved about College Ave. I know all recruits are looking at the new facilities now, and they want new and. And now that I'm in it for a year, I get it because there are some nice stuff in there and yeah. it allows you to do a ton of different things. But uh, I, I always wonder when you played what it was like and and I knew some guys on that team and was it just blue collar and just yeah. like I said, pick up the weight, put it down and let's go to practice and, and bang, right? Listen, we, we, had, we did have some characters, don't get me wrong. We had some real characters, but we had guys that wanted to be the best. And uh, I always think we, we probably didn't, overachieved we probably underachieved with the amount of talent we have but it's circumstance it's timing and timing is everything in life and uh those those years in the 90s we had some really big wins some really competitive games against the top you know teams in the country at the time and uh, it goes to show you that you know Rutgers we do have that little chip on our shoulders New Jersey guys New York guys um you know listening to Mike was in inspirational you know, I was thinking back to my days, just the competitive side of me, you know, coming in as, as a little bit of an underdog. And, uh, you know, I walked in. I don't know if you guys know Alcides Catano, but I walked in and he was the number one tight end in the country. Till this day, he's one of my best friends. He's an amazing human being, amazing father, and he's an amazing football player. But uh, he was the number one guy. I came in as a, you know, a uh, street kid from Queens, New York, walked on campus, looked at this campus. It's like a farm. It looked like a farm. There was no buildings. It didn't look like it looks today. And, uh, you know, I had an opportunity. You know, it was freshman year. We were all redshirted. Uh, Alcides walked, came in with a little bit of uh, academic issue. So he actually had to sit out his freshman year. And I got a chance to play and be like, I was a wide receiver. They said, put your hand in the ground, son. And I said, what does that mean? Because I don't do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get down there and you, you dig it out. And, uh, Scotty, I don't know if you remember uh, Alnardo Webster. Yeah. I tell this story all the time. He was, a, you know, all-conference, Big East, outside linebacker, perfect spe physical specimen, stud. 
I grinded him, me and him grinded every day my redshirt freshman year. And I got an opportunity to do that because Al wasn't on the field. And uh, Al came back in the spring. And I, I guess I did enough uh, to open up coaches' eyes and say, hey, you know what? We're going to move Al Cedis to, the, uh, uh, to be a defensive player. And uh, Al never played tight end again. Yeah. And uh, to his credit, though, I will tell you this. One of the best athletes I've ever seen. Um, free agent, walk on, whatever you want to call it, with the New England Patriots. So he made it. No matter what, he made it. And uh, kudos to him. I, you know, I was inspired by one of my best friends every day. Yeah. And we challenged and battled and unspoken, hey, you, you know, you got me out of my position, but I know you're still the bed MF. Um, it's cool. just go, it goes to show, you know, the type of guys we had. So we, we did have some studs back then. Yeah, that's important for a winning culture, you know, having having that inner competitiveness between guys. Uh, we, Always. We got a, you know that. We got a you know that. We got a comment in the comments here from Joey D. Let's see if you know who Joe D is. He said, my guy. I know who Joe D is. Said, my, guy, <laughs> my guy, MB, number 81, looking good. Such a hammer. Such a beast. A receiver, <laughs> a receiver in the tight ends before <laughs> – before anyone knew it was a trend, most of all the best <laughs> best teammate ever. Oh, that was good. That was cool. Yeah, no, Joey was a great teammate. He's been a great ambassador for Rutgers. Yeah. You know, he's a great Jersey native, and uh, you know, a dear dear friend. Yeah, but he's right. Yeah. I was a I was a nasty football player. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into because I know the side of it you're on now. I want to get into the fan base, but real quick because I know you love your roots, man. You love talk. You're like Anthony. He loves talking about South Plainfield. You're from St. Francis Prep High School. Yep. Uh, and one of the comments here, and I'm, I just lost it. Hold on. One of the comments, have you ever played against Far Rockaway High School and Coach Kirschman? No, I haven't. But uh, uh, the All City team was made up back when I was there of Far Rockaway, um, Ozone Park, East New York, New Utrecht. Uh, all the, obviously, St. Francis Prep was a parochial, so that was the, the they were powerhouse back in the day. Say that again. Lincoln, Lincoln or no? Lincoln, sure. Lincoln, Studs, Wagner, Staten Island. I mean, we had uh, some competitive football back in the 90s, you know, so here's back the in kicker. the public school. Yeah. My grandfather's Coach Kirschman. No. So he coached 35 years at East Rockaway High School, Far Rockaway High School. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that is crazy years. stuff. Wow. Somebody knows. Somebody either knows me or knows yeah, you and wanted to ask it. that question. Say, That's, That's probably my mom going incognito. Yeah, she's right? Mike. Yeah, she's incognito. She's, she's Mike. <laughs> yeah, because we we kicked her off last week. We didn't want her. That's awesome. So, That's awesome. So Marco. So listen. You got. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was, recently, you know, we just had the NFL draft. You know, mm -hmm. as a wrestler, we don't get we don't really get exposed exposure to that kind of thing, or there's no draft for us to become professionals. So. Um, just like, what is it like that excitement of knowing, like, I mean, you got picked 39th overall in the draft, so you most likely knew you were getting picked up. What's that feeling like going into that draft or that, that week where you know you're going to be entering the NFL and it's just like, where am I going to end up kind of thing? Well, it's interesting. Everybody has their own way of handling it. Um, I was fortunate to have a good support group. You know, back home in Queens, uh, my support group would humble me pretty quickly after every game um even my teammates uh, my teammates kept me humble my roommate rob seager he was the best he was he was probably the best guy for me throughout my whole that whole junior senior year process because he's a level-headed guy um lives in reality and there was times where i would be pulled out of reality and have to get back pulled in and he was helpful in that family was helpful in that and I just looked at it this way. You know, I was fortunate when I played that I had that support group would come to every every game, every game, 75 deep, 75 tickets, tailgates, the whole nine. And uh, I thought it was more for them than it was for me because I was going I was going to go through the journey and I was going to be in the journey. But they lived their life around that journey. And it was more important to me for me to have them highlighted at the time. So I literally just stayed home. Uh, you guys know Fooch, right? Yeah. So Fooch actually covered it yeah. for MSG at the time. So Fooch is the only Rutgers and you know guy from this culture right now that was there with me yeah. and celebrated with me. 
And uh, it was great. It was great for the family. It was great for my friends. It was great for my neighborhood. Uh, it was great for me because I got paid. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nah, but uh no nah, listen it was it was a great experience i loved it um the result of where i went it was interesting my agent at the time was like hey this is probably not the team you want to go to the Bengals at the time yeah. but uh you make the best out of it you make yeah. the best of it and i will say this with today with, with today's situation um the drift they did a really good job and i think that the job that was overlooked was that the kids were forced to stay with their families. See, I'm not a big fan of the guys who go to, you know, Paramount, yeah, yeah. MSG, Chicago, sit there with their gold, their fancy suits. Listen, that changes in an instant when you get to training camp. Those guys, they don't last. Yeah. And uh, it's a rude awakening. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. I thought the same thing, too. It was great seeing you had to be with your family. During yeah. that whole time, I thought that was pretty. It, went, it wasn't just the first rounders or the first nah. 15 guys. They went like 40 deep. So, yeah, that was neat. Uh, I want to get back. I want to get back real quick. Why? Because I do want to talk. I don't want to bore you with all the NFL talk. I'm sure you get that all the time. But I want to know the recruiting process. Why are you? What made you decide on are you at the time? That support group. That, uh, you know, the 75 deep. Uh, listen, I'm a New York City kid. Born and raised. Still live here in the city. Um Going to Jersey was getting out, you know, looking at Rutgers, looking at that opportunity. P people might not know this, but I, I used to go to Doug Graber's football camp. So I actually would have my mom drive me out to, you know, Rutgers at the time, Cook, Cook Campus at the, at the time, and uh, thought it was like 200 miles away. It's, it's not that far. <laughs> and uh, I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with my coaching staff. They were, you know, real guys. They would tell it like it is. They would tell you if you stink. If you had a good game, they'd tell you you had a good game. And that started at the camp. And, uh, and it's funny, back to Alcides, but Alcides was the man in that camp. And I just looked at it and said, you know, we can be a great tandem. And, uh, you know, I went on recruiting trips. I enjoyed them. They were fun. You know, the Big East schools. Uh, something about Rutgers. Yeah. It's just weird. Something about Rutgers. Something about being a guy. Listen, Anthony, you know this from firsthand. It's easy to have, well, if you have a reputation, if your brand is strong, where you live, you yeah. have pride, you have commitment to your locals, let's call it. You pack up, go somewhere else, okay, and you fail. Guess what? Everybody forgets about you. What happened to that kid? Oh, you, lo you know, he lost it. He didn't, he didn't succeed. He didn't take it to the next level. When you can do that in your home state where people are expecting it, that shows your character. Yeah. And that's why I love Anthony. I mean, he, he showed his character from day one. And uh, I love guys that do that. And we talk about the New Jersey thing. Guys, we got to keep, yeah, we got to keep all these guys home. You know what? This is your home state. Have pride in your home. And... Uh, yeah, that was the reason. Yeah, man, I Love it. I heard you talking about that before, like, uh, just like talking about guys staying in the tri-state area and continuing building their brand. Like, you you have this brand in high school. If you're a, if you're a top-notch football player, basketball player, even wrestler in the tri-state area, you you created this brand. Your family's probably a big Italian family, you know. Totally. And and, uh, <laughs> and they yeah. they came to all your all your games, your matches, you know. Like, why not continue that trend instead? Like you talked about it before. Like, if you if you leave, I mean, the grass is never always greener. It's not always greener on the other side. Yeah. You're starting a whole new life if you move far away. A whole new brand. You got to you got to create that that pop. Absolutely. And think about it. When you're a freshman and you're going through the process and it's hard and it's a grind. And there's that moment where you're like, Am I, can I continue to do this? It's easy to quit when nobody's watching. You couldn't quit. Right. You, I couldn't quit. I couldn't go home on a weekend and then face the wrath that I was going to face when I drove down Cross Bay Boulevard in Howard Beach. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to be a good situation. Right. So you get out there, you grind. And when it hurts, you grind some more. And when it hurts more, you grind some more. And, uh, you know. You just know, always know where you came from. Yeah. And we, when you look there, you know where you are. It was always a little bit more, motiva more motivation, too, when it came time where those home games came around. You know, you get to look up and see those 75 family members. Totally. totally. And it's like 
those yeah. like you're saying those times that are down you're like well this isn't just me on this journey man i, I brought a lot of people along with me so listen it's also a performance you know that yeah you're performing. Yeah. You like to be on stage. Yeah. You like to be mano a mano. That's why I find your sport amazing. I mean, we have battles, interior battles on the offensive line. You know that, Scotty. Yep. Um, you, you do one-on-ones. That's great. But when it's just you and an opponent, and that it, it, and I call it an embarrassing factor, nobody wants to be outshined ever. Yeah. And that's how you take your training. That's how Scotty takes his coaching. That's how Mike takes his coaching. Yeah. That's how I played the game. Yeah. I was I was more fearful of failing, embarrassing myself, and letting my coach down. Letting my coach down was probably number one. And Doug Graben knows that. Stan Parrish knows that. Um, and that's when you build trust with the coach. Yeah. You know, when your coach can trust you. Uh, you're accountable. You're consistent. That's when he, he told me the freshman year. When you're consistent, you'll play on the field. Yeah. Until then, it's not happening. And we're, I feel like uh, the younger generations are not losing that fear of a coach. But I mean, I'm coaching little kids. I get more and more kids that question something I tell mm-hmm. them to do. It's like when I was their age, I was getting hit, like, not slapped by my dad, but like, <laughs> yeah, it was no, it was known that coach says something. It didn't matter if that coach never wrestled in his life before. You're listening and you're doing it as hard as you can. And uh, I, w- I try to instill, not instill like super discipline to these kids, but the kids that I teach, I try to instill that and let them know, like, listen, I was great at wrestling. I didn't care who taught me. I was listening. So you, 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 I'm sure you'll find this funny, but when I was coaching my son's Pop Warner team, I could probably coach the dads and play better football and have them listen to every word I said than their children. And they would say, listen to Coach Pataglia. He went, you know, he played in the NFL. And they were like, all right. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I had the guys more intrigued than the kids. And the kids You'll find that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, listen, it, it, it's, it's generational, right? I probably didn't listen to my father as much as I probably should have. Right, right. But, uh, you know. Let me listen. ask you this. How, how cool is it having – I know Anthony has a banner in the rack. How cool is it having your name? on that practice facility. No, it's, it's amazing. Let's be honest. We, we, you know, we all know Jeff and Amy Towers, you know, graciously, they, uh, they took the lead in advancing our program and uh, they knew the importance of it. They still continue to know the importance of it. And uh, to have them bestow that, that honor on me was pretty imp- impressive. And it, uh, you know, every day I count my blessings and I, I pretty much thank them every day. <laughs> I bet, man. So I got I got one more important one and a bunch of little quick hitters that I think you'll like. Uh, what you're doing now with the foundation and dealing with people and fundraising and raising money for the program. And last year was tough, right? Let's make no yeah. bones about it. When you're yeah. not winning at the football side of it, yeah. makes it really, really hard. So talk a little bit about that, what you went through, and now what's it like with Coach Yano back? Because I know everybody, well, including myself, is pretty yeah. Well, last year was tough. Let's be honest. And, you know, you you and Steve and all the other sports have done such a great job. And, uh, you know, let's face it, we struggled last year. We, let, we struggled the past few years to just have Greg back on campus. And I know how your relationship, um, your history with him, he's been great. He's been, he is the CEO. He has truly grown into being a football head coach, you know, and we, we are fortunate enough to speak a lot and uh, just listening to him now, as opposed to eight to 10 years ago, it's a different man. He's a different man and he's done an amazing job. I think his work ethic has shown immediately uh, in, in the results of the recruits that we're seeing come sign, uh, sign their letter. So, um, you know, it, it's been tough, but you know what? We have great fans. We have great alumni. We have great donors. We have a great team. Um, you know, people have a special affinity to Rutgers. You know, G- New Jerseyans, New Yorks, Connecticut. If you've done Rutgers, okay, Rutgers was Todd. It was hard. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm still getting an echo. But, um, you know, Rutgers is a grind. And uh, if you can past the four years and get out, you realize what a grind it is, but it makes you hard. It makes you gritty. Um, so to come back and help, and we have fantastic guys, guys and gals that uh, contribute back to the program. So uh, it's been a lot. 
I'll put it to you this way. I'm smiling a lot more than I was in the past few years. <laughs> how did how did you uh, end up coming back to work for Rutgers? Did you always stay in contact through your years in the NFL, or did they kind of recruit you when you were all done? Um, how did that job come come to be? So I finish up in 2005. I spent seven years in private sector. I owned my own business. And then, you know, I've, I always came back to Rutgers. You know, people would always see me back at the games. I, you know, I love just being a part of the camaraderie, um, homecoming. You know, probably, I probably did two games a season, you know, just with time, timing and effort, just trying to get here. Um, but uh, 2014, when I got the word, you know, Tim and I were roommates. Tim Pernetti at the time was the AD. He, um, you know, gave me a call and said, hey, we're getting into the Big Ten. And I'll never forget it. I actually went to the Big East basketball term, that tournament that day, that weekend. And Mike Rice was the coach. And uh, I'm sitting there with Doug Dolan. And Doug and I are talking about, hey, we should, you know, maybe we should get you back on board here and you could work for Rutgers. This will be great. We're going into the Big Ten. I'm like, this is great. Awesome. Let's do it. I'm ready. Two weeks later, uh, obviously something <laughs> happened and uh, kind of changed Rutgers athletics, shifted it, and uh, got no feedback from anyone. Doug and I still tried to press it. Uh, we hired Julie. We hired, hired Sarah. Uh, Doug was forcing the, the issue and uh, met Sarah, met Julie, and then, you know, the rest is history. I've been here since 2014. It's been an amazing experience. It's great to be back. Uh, just amongst people that I knew 20 years ago, building new friendships, relationships within the uh, department, fans, new coaches, just seeing everybody grow, seeing the place grow. And I think we're all on the same page where uh, we know this place is special. You know, Scotty, kudos to you. You guys have just blown it out of the water. And uh, that that is seen by everybody, not just the wrestling family. It's It's seen by everybody. And you know, it's made everybody else's life a lot easier. And uh, it just goes to show you, great leadership um, builds a great culture. And uh, you guys are doing it great. And foot, Greg's going to do it great. Steve's doing it. Vivian's doing it. Everybody's doing it. You could tell it's all starting to happen, man. Yeah. It's all starting to come together. It's going to be exciting. Uh, you're going to be at the forefront of that. Uh, no question about it. So one, the best thing about this job, and Anthony, as you get older and continue through this whole, whether it's coaching or whatever it is, or continuing to help little kids and just meeting some of the coolest people. I, I was fortunate enough to meet Marco and go on some dinners with him, get to the city with him and do some pretty cool things with him. And that's the best part of my job, man, meeting guys like you and having friendships with guys like you. It's, it's just, I love it. I love it. I just, it's all about relationships and I'm grateful for it, man. You're, you're just a, a breath of fresh air and it's it's been it's awesome so i know we got a long way to go we got a lot of work to do we'll get this thing bigger and better and i'm excited about that yeah man uh, uh, i was first introduced uh me and my dad my dad took me out to eat a lot as a freshman sophomore in college and these these going you always find marco in a restaurant right <laughs> yep yep these these going out to eat so we're more like all right i need to talk to you because it seems like you're off in this area so it's like let me ask you to go to eat and then talk to you about life but we go to the place this place shock i think it was called shaka it was on a shaka. corner and it's, not a, corner. it's not a, it's not there anymore it's rooster spin or something now but uh i see marco in there that's like my first introduction my dad immediately knew he's a huge fan and uh he kind of like we shook hands and i i met him i think that was my first time ever meeting him and he, i just remember him just being like this huge presence and it was probably 2014 right around when you were taking that job 15 yeah. and uh in my head, I, I remember we, he drove me back to my dorm or apartment wherever I was living. I was just like, who is that? Like asking a lot of questions I was like, damn, he still looks like he could play. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's that, just that presence that you bring, man. You control the, sit the situation, the conversation, man. Um, and I, that was my first introduction, man. I just thought you were, you were this great representative of Rutgers. And I was immediately like, I need to get to know this guy. Who is this guy? Kind of, kind of thing, kind of moment for me. Well, thank you very much. But I, I, looking back on your career, I am so impressed and how you represent our school. Yeah. You literally, I literally watched you grow into what everybody expected, and that shows your character. And that was what I was trying to say before, that your brand coming out of Plainfield, you know, everybody knew who you are. You stayed home. 
you went about your business and you got your ultimate to your ultimate dream and your goal. And we watched that like we all watched it grow. Yeah. It was a beautiful thing. Just fo- following in the footsteps before me, man. You set you set the trail. <laughs> I love it. Listen, I got a couple quick hitters. Yeah. We'll let you go. Get back to your family. No, um, please, no. I'm going to wait for Please, please. <laughs> we'll stay on this all day. Me too. But you were talking about an island. I, 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 can I take a private jet right now? We're going to get to that. That's the last one. Quick hitters. One or two words. Or I, with you, it's never going to be one or two words, which is fine. So, one pro you couldn't wait to be on the same field with, right? You played with the Bengals. It doesn't have to be a teammate. You couldn't wait to go to uh, Pittsburgh to play against so and so. You know what I'm trying to say. So mm-hmm. one guy you couldn't wait to be on the same field with, and it was a pretty cool experience. I might be a psycho, but as a kid, I would never buy anyone's jersey because I felt I was always better. It didn't matter who it was. I, it could have been a tennis player. I was better than that guy. Um, two guys: Michael Jordan's presence at all. Obviously, couldn't do that because it can't shoot. Emmett Smith. Yeah. Watching Emmett because as my college years when Dallas was blowing up, at, growing up a big Cowboy fan, being on the same field with Emmett Smith, I said, wow, I really did arrive. Nobody else, though. It, it, it's weird. Like, yeah. all the big guys, like Emmett Smith. Yeah. You know, I kind of I, I kind of knew you were – not you were going with Emmett, but I kind of knew you felt that way. Like, you're not a fan, right? You're you're just as good as those guys. and. I was never a fan. Like I, people ask me all the time, like, what's it like to coach against John Smith and Kale? I'm like, or brands. I'm like, I don't, I don't even think no. that way. I'm just, I'm trying to beat them. Like, I don't, I'm not totally. a fan, you know? So I, yeah. I get where you're coming from. The whole Jordan thing. Have you, have you watched the documentary? What <sighs> do you think? Cause that's a every, big part of you. I get I goosebumps every, every minute watching it. It just brings me back to a great time in my life. And just wa- knowing at the time, not taking him for granted, knowing that is what the best looks like competitive in every aspect, it's been the best TV in 20 years. I love it. I love it. So I don't have to ask you. I was going to ask you Jordan or LeBron. Who? Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Jordan. I love it. Greatest, greatest are you moment? Oh, man. Um, honestly, there's been so many, and you put them in different categories. I mean – there's personal ones. There's Anthony. I'm going to tell you Anthony's story because it's not. When you won the national championship, I was in a cigar lounge in Queens. And that's awesome. you're not allowed to watch wrestling in this, in, in this cigar lounge. It's right in the main street. There's detectives, like judges. Everybody's watching basketball, football. And I go, guys, we have to put this on. And they're like, what are we watching? I had the whole place in 10 minutes rooting for you. <laughs> and, and, and I said, Ant, don't let me down. Don't let me down. So that was a great moment for me and Anthony together. But uh, greatest moments, um, I mean, I, I would be crazy if I didn't say playing Penn State in the Meadowlands, uh, the game that put me national on a national map. Um my final game against Boston College, where we were up, we were down, we ended up losing the last game of the season. But uh, I don't, I can't remember many things. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. Like playing sports, you just yeah. can't remember many things. I remember the way I felt leaving the field that day. Um, people were smart enough to stay away from me. I was like in a zone, and my one guy that came up to me, my head coach Doug Graber, knew he looked, searched me out grabbed me and walked me off the, the field. It was perfect. That's awesome. That's awesome. Perfect. Who's the best player in college you played against? Um I get you thinking player. here, right, Marco? I get you thinking. Yeah. Um <laughs> because again, I like <laughs> I feel like it was me. Yeah, yeah. Um probably man to man um, you know, Ray's Ray Lewis, you know, Ray's been a great football player, but like you, you know, I got I had Ray sometimes real good. Yeah. Um I think the most unique. I, I can't answer that. I gotta be honest with you, because there's been so many guys, but I still I, I won't I won't what's the word? I won't give in. Yeah. I can't give I in. I'm it. a competitor. I can't even say those words, mouth those words. But I will say the coolest guy I played against, The Rock. Dwayne yeah. Johnson. 
That's cool. So, Anthony, you'll get a kick out of this. My son's a huge yeah. WWE fan. So the Rock's, like, lighting it up across, you know, every Tuesday, Wednesday night, whenever <laughs> it was. And I'm like, hey, you know, Daddy used to play against the Rock. And he looked at me. He gave me a look like, Dad, what? <laughs> I had to bust out the old footage and have him. There was one play where I caught a ball. It was like, a, like a, Ray Lucas dumps me a ball, dumps me down at, like a, on a screen. I take it, and The Rock is literally on my back. And I'm just running with The Rock. I'm running with The yeah, Rock. And he just goes wild. dead leg. He goes dead leg, and he's dragging yeah. me. And I'm dragging him. And then Ray comes over, hits me. Warren Sapp comes over and hits me. And then I get up, and he's like, Dad, that's not The Rock. It says Johnson on his jersey. And then he turned around, and I paused it. It was like on a VHS. I paused it, and he goes, Dad, that's The Rock. I said, that's The Rock. So that was the most, you know, that's that's fun stuff. But, um, that's cool. I, you know, there were so many guys we played against, Scotty. Um, you know, different quarterbacks. Kerry Collins, Kajana Carter, O.J. McDuffie, phenomenal player. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I went to every single Penn State home game in '94 because I went to Lock Haven. Yeah, I was right yeah. down the road. I went. To I mean, they were studs. Team. That was the best team in the country, and we team. listen. We battled with them. Won we the battled with them. Won the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Oregon, the Rose Bowl. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I got a, crazy. I got a little question for you for one of my buddies back home. He's a football coach. Um, he wanted to know since you got drafted to Cincinnati, played there for a couple of years. Joe Burrow just got drafted there. Yeah. Um, in your own personal opinion, do you think he could go there and make an impact and win? I do. Um, he's got the demeanor. He's got the confidence. You have to have ultra confidence in that town. Um, it's a, now. Let, wait. Let me let me step back. Cincinnati is a great place to live. I I, I enjoyed my six years there like no other. I mean, it's phenomenal people, fans. You know, they have it all. They really are uh, like a really um, little hidden gem. It goes down to leadership, management. At the time we were there, the management, the leadership wasn't great. I'm not mentioning any names, but organizationally, you know, there's certain ways to run a business and certain ways not to run a business. Um, but su what supersedes that is personality, charisma. Uh, and Joe's going to be a guy that can pull that off. Totally. Totally. Should be good to say. He's going to do well. Yeah. Real two more. Bruce or Bon Jovi? Bruce. Yeah. I kind of knew you were going. I figured that. And then and then our last one, we ask all of our guests, you're allowed to bring three people to an island. And I know you got a chance to think about this. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a COVID-19, you know, a couple months maybe. This is right. this could last up to a year. So who are you bringing and, and we allow our guests to bring the wife because we get you're going to say that. No. The 47 <laughs> trade days. They want me out. Nobody yeah, wants me in this house anymore. No, I've been locked in this no office kids, no for 47 days. No kids, no I go to the gym. Actually, you're going to have a tough time getting me out because I'm getting in shape again. Uh, I'm working out once a day. I'm doing uh, conditioning. <laughs> um, so. What, you run it? Different. You run it against Stutter and John again? <laughs> I'd never do that again. I mean, have you guys seen that on, on I saw it. I YouTube? looked it up this morning. I had to do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that was an interesting. No. Um, I will say, though, Howard is an amazing person. He's an amazing interview, but he's an amazing person. You know, he's one of those guys that you, uh, you know, you have a conversation with, and he's listening. He truly is listening. He's not just whatever. But let's get back to the island. PG-13. Um, well, I'm just going to say the obvious. I think as an adult who's lost a parent, um, as a child, as a teenager, as an adolescent, you don't recognize the importance of the things they're trying to tell you. So my father, who's an immigrant, who, you know, didn't say much his whole life, his whole life, passed away in 2010. And uh, to just get back in front of him and have a real adult conversation saying to myself, yeah, you were more right than you were wrong. And as a young kid, you don't think that, uh, and just all the circumstances, but, um, I would say my dad, um, I liked, I liked Mike's entertainment, Mike, you know, Frank Sinatra, but, um, 
But um, <laughs> no, nah, it wouldn't be him. I think it would be Jordan. Um, because, I mean, we're getting to see him every Sunday. He's a real dude. He's just a real guy. He's got a cigar. He's got a scotch. You know, he's he, think about it. As he reti- after he retired, you haven't seen the man in, in, in the spotlight. You know, and uh, I like that he he's got a humility to him that an athlete of his stature he's confident and he'll like he'll put you in your place if you don't recognize his his strengths. But uh, he still always had a humility that came across the camera, you know, unbelievably. So I would say my dad, Jordan, and I really would just want Babe Ruth. I'm a huge Yankee fan. It's not Lou Gehrig. It's not, you know, Jeets. It's not A-Rod. Although A-Rod's living a good life right now. <laughs> uh, he's already been trapped on that island. <laughs> Just so you know. Marco, That's a good said, island to be trapped on. I said I said Mattingly when I when I gave my yeah. name. Mattingly was one of them. When, yeah, well, when we grew up, he was the yeah, guy. He was I mean, the guy. he was the guy. But after listening to all the stories, you know, I think DiMaggio would have been boring, although he was one of the best. I think Mickey Mantle, you you probably would have been dead in two, 24 hours for yep. you, him and Whitey yep. Ford. Uh, <laughs> Lou Gehrig was probably probably a guy you want to sit and talk to about just being great and gr- like grinding. But Babe Ruth, he hit it all. Yep. He hit it all. I mean, you yep. would have fun. You could understand the game. Um, and he's he's one of those legends. Marco, were you a baseball player in high school as well as football? I any, was. Any yep. other sports? Basketball. I did, I actually did play basketball in the city in the uh, Catholic league, which was a great league. Yeah. Say it again. Three sport guy. Were you, I was. Were you, yeah, my whole career. As, uh, wow. Was you? Were you as talented in the other two sports? Like, did you? Have- baseball. Yeah. I mean, basketball. I was bigger and stronger than those the guys. Even though I was playing against some of the best that ever played in like New York City and went on to bigger and better things in the NBA. But they were all skinny at the time, and I was like a big kid, so I can muscle them out. I could get rebounds and make a layup. I couldn't shoot. Yeah, dude, listen, man, uh, this is this has been a lot of fun. You're the man. Yeah. I miss you. It's been a while since we got together. We got to get in this when this all clears up. All of us with Anthony will get to the city and uh, yeah, to one of those cigar. But we'll get to a good restaurant first, and then we'll. Well, he's a legend in my neighborhood. Anthony's a legend in my neighborhood. <laughs> Him and Nick, <laughs> they're legends. I'd say we go to your neighborhood, but I'm sure you want to get out of there. So we'll get to the city, <laughs> get to the city, and uh. Enjoy a night out and end up at a cigar bar. That'd be fun, man. I appreciate sure. you coming on, Marco. My pleasure, yeah. guys. You're doing a great job. Keep it Thank up. Thank you for coming Thanks, on, man. man. You're the best. Yeah. yeah, that was good, man. You're not a click off, right? Yep. There he is. Yeah. He's the man, dude. That, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. You have no idea the influence you made on so many people, man. When just winning, just wrestling in that match and winning that match. Yeah. It's crazy. You would have never thought that, right? Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's always crazy to hear those stories, but also super – like rewarding, man. That's similar to his story. He wanted to go to Rutgers and make a change. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. So to have that change where people, well, he's sitting in New York city, making people, I've heard that story, not that cigar bar story, but like I've heard a couple different fans say that. And yeah. it's like, man, it's just like how many people were watching this match or into this moment. Um, and- Anybody involved in New Jersey yeah. wrestling, Rutgers wrestling, anybody in- involved with Rutgers, was watching that and they would get in bars to turn it on. I got so many videos from Hoboken and and even down at Jenkinson's down the Jersey Shore where yeah. people were at and they would send me those clips. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, we got so, we got a state a fan backstage. You think we're still taking fans on here? Yeah, let's I mean, heck, it's we're an hour and twenty in. Might as well keep playing, you know. Yeah. The good thing about that, you can keep watching this. Yeah. So you don't have to watch the whole thing. You can just pick and choose. Uh so I got, yeah. Let's get them, let's bring them on. Oh, hey guys, what's going on? Third time. We're in, uh, look, can you see this? Hold on. Lock Haven. Ah, the Haven. Look at that. 70 years of excellence. Yeah. Uh, we're cleaning our office out. We uh, moved into our new dig. So we're. Uh, they don't have got a picture of me on, on there. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're, you're the guy with the tights on. <laughs> that's probably Craig Simons, right? Yeah, yep, yep. That's yeah. who it is. Yeah. Guys, great job. How's it going? Enjoy, enjoyed, enjoyed listening to you guys. Bataglia, great guy. Hey, you rem- you remember that time in Shaka when we saw him? 
Yeah. And, yep. And, you, you never know, you know, how yeah. things are going to go. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So yeah. good job. Good job. I'm jealous that you're playing golf tomorrow. Goody. I am. I'm going to play a lot of golf tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to play a lot on Sunday. Are you going to go 30, 36 <laughs> holes tomorrow, Goody? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't wait. I can't well, wait. So it's good to see things are changing. Things are changing here. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a slow go, but hopefully everybody continues. So, and hopefully we'll get you guys. Are you, are you confident? Are you confident? We'll be back up and running in September. Where are you? September? You know more oh, yeah. than we do? Where, what do you think? I think, uh, I yeah. think by the middle of June, you know, things will be okay. like 75%, something you, like that. You think, you think, right. it, and listen, you're going to have to social distance and you're going to have to wear mm -hmm. masks to stadiums. I think yeah. you have to do those things. Yeah, the other problem, you know, that's, that's okay. we used to call the cops when people came in like this. All right. Now it's a you know, now, now you can't do it. Now everybody's got it. It's yeah. crazy. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. So all right. I just wanted to say hello to guy. Good job. We've been listening here in the in the yeah, office. Yeah, good seeing you, man. We'll get together soon. Thanks for calling yep. in. All right. All right. We'll see you soon. Love to see you. Yep. Yeah, hey, that's cool. He, he finally that's figured so... out the audio situation. Sounded clear <laughs> this week. Yeah. He looks good, man. He looks like he's happy too. So maybe things are getting yeah. better. Yeah, I was. You know? He said mid June, man. I'm now. I'm hoping DJ's is open for my birthday, June 25th. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably hoping. How's your roommates doing? How's Simmons and the Simmons boys doing? Good. good. He's got a little pup that he bought a couple of weeks ago. Uh, little, I saw that. I saw the yeah, pics. Cute little dog. So we're taking care of the dog. Name's Loki. Uh, they're just working, man. It's funny. Like I, I don't have a typical nine to five job so i'm kind of like i work out but other than that i'm just kind of like annoying just kind of bing bonging around the house trying to find things to do yep. so uh it's it's an interesting it's an interesting oh. role i'm playing here in the house good man well that's good you have nothing to do let's hopefully uh yeah like your dad says we're up and running but let's start thinking about another guest we'll get to, i'm sure people will chime in on who they want to hear uh, but let's start thinking as this week goes uh who we want to bring on. That was good today. That was fun, man. That was fun. I start to panic though, because I want to listen to DeMarco and then I could have sat and listened yeah. to Marco, uh, but tag forever. I could have kept going. I don't know how long this is supposed to be. This yeah. is just you and I yeah. kind of shooting the shit here a little bit. Yeah. So whatever, wherever it takes you. you yeah. Know? We, uh, we, you did. I don't know if you were just didn't want to get into Marco's NFL. I was kind of curious about uh, some of the coaches he played for, but you know, you're right. He probably hears that all the time. We got some, yeah, he got probably, a different yeah. look from him, which was cool. I know that's what I wanted too. I don't want the same, like I'm sure all the Rutgers people that are chiming in, you know, they're like probably we heard all these already. So I just wanted yeah. something different. And then, you know, sure enough, with him, you're gonna get a lot too. So yeah. a huge personality, huge personality. Yeah, the session was phenomenal. You made my Friday great again. Keep it up, guys. You're the best. That's awesome. It's kind of all we're really trying to do, yeah. you know. Kind of all hey, trying did to your do, uh, so. did your sister beat you in any of the workouts yet? No, and did you see her kettlebell yeah. swings? She doesn't even do uh, a squat. I mean, those are gotta, weak. Come on, I, I was gonna say I you got to touch the ground if you're gonna use twenties. You got a little bit. I mean, do <laughs> something. I mean, that was and she she will too because I'll see her today. It's Riley's birthday. She'll be like, I did that workout. And I'm gonna have to. No, you didn't do the workout. It was a half ass workout, and that it bothers me that. But whatever, she'll hit me with I did three hundred and forty. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie, you know, me and Mike go back and forth. But like, I'll I'll beat Mike in number wise. But then we see each other's videos, man. Like his per his push ups are like perfect. My my put my push ups are like dick, 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 dick. <laughs> yeah. so maybe I win sometimes. But really, who's the real winner in those? Um, yeah, yeah. So well, Zach put out the video of him beating me, and all his friends uh, got on board, and then so I got mad. You know, I got mad. I said, let's do an Olympics. I put down ten events. I'm like, let's go Olympics. And here's the deal. You won't beat me yeah. anything. Like pickleball, I'm not bringing him to the picnic. <laughs> he can't golf. He can't play pickleball. He could do – he runs fast. That's it. You run fast. So that's kind of the argument we have like after that workout. The, the Adam Sandler movie, man. You guys are going <laughs> to <laughs> – So we're going to do it. That's but. good. All right, man. Let's uh, let's get going. Let's stay in touch. We'll, uh, we'll obviously – Look at Doc Haley. Great job. Must Thank see you, TV. Doc. Doc's Doc Haley, my, my back is yep. jacked up right now. Ba bad mattress no. situation. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep let's keep turning these out and uh, see who we're going to bring Sounds on next good, week. Man. Yeah, we'll get it. Let the viewers know. Okay. All right, man. All right, see I'll see you, man.